Good evening. Good to see everybody in the Lord's house tonight, and I hope you've had a great day, and I know it, uh, I had an interesting day, but it is definitely good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Uh, so let's stand as we sing, uh, I'll Fly Away. Wonderful day when that happens, and we're going to stand, keep, keep standing, and we're going to keep singing about heaven uh, with Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. of a city 
remain standing as we look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do look forward to that wonderful day where we'll be in your presence uh, in eternity, uh, where we will be your people, and you are God. Uh, just uh, thanks so much for gathering us here in your house tonight to be in your presence in this special capacity as we uh, worship you in spirit and truth tonight. Uh, we just pray that you uh, be with um, Brother Kyle as he speaks. Uh, Lord, just uh, lay your words upon him, be with the special music. And may all that we say and do tonight be honoring and glorifying to you. Uh, we pray your blessings upon this offering for the good of your service and your kingdom's work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Circle by a heavy burden I was neath the load of guilt and shame In the hand of Jesus touched me Something 
doing this evening? Good, good, good. Got a little break in the weather, huh? That was good. What was the high today? Still hot. Hey, Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And uh, as you're doing that, I want to remind you that we do have outreach, organized outreach tomorrow evening. And uh, I want to put a plug in, too. We have, a, at the end of August, we're having our, well, it's typically the middle of the year church worker meeting, but it's taken on a little bit of a different uh, direction and approach. Uh, God's been burdening me with some things for a while, and, um, and so I think we're going to look at the, the middle of the year worker meeting in a little different way moving forward and so uh, it just made sense the first time that we moved it to July didn't work and so we moved it to August and it works really good because we're going into the fall and that's when everything kind of kicks off and so uh, we're going to if, if, if you signed up for, uh, for our email newsletter you saw that uh, there's some different time frames on the meeting on the 25th the first time frame is all of the the elders and deacons and their wives uh, and then the second time frame is all of the uh, ministry leaders. And then the third one is all the rest of the church. So uh, it'll kind of be a, a, a less of a time frame for the, all the church workers, but a longer day or a normal, the normal time for all the leadership. And so we're going to really be focusing on leadership and uh, trying to, to develop our leadership in our church and see it, um, see it grow and, and rise to I believe what glorifies God even more. So um, so that is August 25th. Hopefully you've already marked your calendars Saturday. Um, and very important for all of, all of our workers and leaders to be in that, in that meeting. Um, I do want to say, uh, please be in prayer for, uh, I know you have been and continue to, but the Rogers family, they are uh, intending to head out and head back to Nicaragua. Uh, on the 14th, which is next Tuesday, but tonight I think is their last service here. Is that right? Um, and so they're going to be trying to get packed up and then head down to uh, their the area where their sending church is and where they're going to be flying out of near Houston or in Houston. And so we want to keep them in prayer and keep uh, praying that God's will is done and that, that he would direct their steps and they would clearly see. Uh, they've been praying, you know what, if it's not God's will still uh, for God to stop it and to close the door, uh, but if it's his will that it'll just be open and they can continue to go down there um, and uh, exercise a little bit different uh, wisdom and understanding uh, in the ministry down there. So uh, keep them in prayer. So uh, in the last message that we, we did last week uh, in this, we saw that God is faithful and that he's faithful to strengthen us for everything in this life and every way that we need strengthening. And if you were here, uh, I was talking about sometimes strength and we, we want it in a certain way, a particular way. Uh, are we having problems? Do what? Oh, good. It's more like 10, Brother Joe. No, 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 um, anyways, we have an idea of what uh, God's strength looks like and, and when we're supposed to get it and how we're supposed to get it. But uh, what we saw is that God is perfect in providing his strength. He's faithful. And so when he in his faithfulness and in his mercy and his compassion allows certain things to come in our life, whether they're trials whether you consider them a test or storm or whatever the case may be, or he brings us to a place, a season of pruning, a place of growing, a place of cultivation. And what we saw is that in those times, we're to press into God even more uh, and to trust him even more. And in that, 
waiting patiently for him to give that strength that he promises that will show up in our time of need. Um, and again, we'll find that it's what pleases him, it's what is benefit to us in our life, and uh, again, ultimately brings him glory. And so tonight we're going to look at another way that God is faithful. We're going to get to the end of this verse 3. It's taken us, I think, three or four messages now to get through verse 3. Uh, because it is, it's, it's so uh, important what uh, Paul is saying here. So uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into this. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to be here again. Uh, thank you for the promises that you give us in your word. Thank you for the instruction that you give us in your word. And tonight as we see uh, even more uh, promise and more instruction, I pray that we would be ready in our hearts, ready in our minds, God, that our spiritual eyes and ears would be open and, again, ready to receive what you have for us. God, we, we're in desperate need of you in our lives. Uh, whether we acknowledge that on a day-to-day -day basis and a moment-by-moment -moment basis, that's the truth, is we need you. We need your word, and I pray that we would uh, learn tonight what you want us to learn, to grab, to be reminded, whatever is necessary in our lives. And we'll praise you for all this, God. We uh, ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. But again, the Lord is faithful. We've already seen this. Who shall establish you or set your feet, strengthen you, and keep you from evil? Now, again, Paul is being inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this to the Thessalonian believers who were under persecution. They were facing this affliction. They were facing this difficult time. And so Paul is saying that God is faithful, who will give you the strength that you need, and will keep you from evil. Now, if you look at that, you say, wait a second, keep them from evil. And if we're applying this 2,000 years later in our lives, keep us from evil, then what does that mean? Again, it's clear that the Thessalonians were surrounded by evil. It's clear that evil was even being carried out in their life. They were, they were being persecuted for being Christians. And so Paul is telling them God's faithful to, 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 to give you strength and to protect you from evil. And so many of them might have, if they didn't understand what he was saying, would have said, well, that's not true. God's not faithful because we're going through these difficult times. We're going through these bad, th these bad things. And evil is not only surrounding us, it's personally affecting us. And I think that we could say the same thing today. If God is faithful to keep us from evil, and if we were understanding that in the wrong way, we would say, well, I don't know that God's faithful to, to, to keep me from evil because this happened to me when I was a child, or this happened to my, my parents, or this happened to my family, or this, this has happened to me in my life, and it's evil, it's wrong, it's bad. So is this God not being faithful when this happens? Sometimes God is faithful to keep us from evil, sometimes he is not. Again, we think about the Thessalonians, and it's clear they were experiencing evil in the midst of their faithfulness to God. So what is it? It's referring to the evil one, similar to what Paul was talking about when the wicked will be revealed uh, in that the end times, the evil, the evil one, or evil, the evil one is that one he's talking about, be protected from the evil one. And so right off the bat, if you have your notes, the first point is this, we have a promise of protection from the evil one. Again, we realize that sin is present in this world, and it's still affecting our lives. Uh, sin is present because God is still saving sinners. Uh, I had a discussion with somebody. I shared that with you guys several weeks back. We had a discussion with someone at their home who said, well, I, just, uh, I don't even understand why there has to be all this evil and bad in the world. And I said, well, what would you want God to do to fix the problem? Would you, would you want him to, to just rid the whole earth of it? And they said, yeah. Well, I said, one day he's going to do that. But in the process, you know what God has done? He has fixed the problem by dying for the problem himself. And I said, what else would you want God to do to solve the problem other than die himself for the problem? I, said, I never thought of it like that. But again, we understand that sin is in the world still because God is still saving sinners. But there's going to come a day, we know that that day's coming soon, that the door of opportunity for salvation is going to be closed. So, because it's still open because there's still sin, because there's still evil, evil, the consequences of evil, the consequences of sin permeate just about every aspect of our life. If you think about your jobs, those of you who work in secular jobs, uh, there's, there's an aspect of evil that you get frustrated with probably at times, whether it's corruption or greed or dishonesty or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, it can be found even in, in, in Christian jobs because there's people, because there's sinners present there. But again, it permeates every aspect of our life. 
But when we look at this and we realize this and we accept this, that we live in this world, that evil is present, that evil uh, permeates every aspect of our life in some, in some sense of the word, even in the church, we see that evil makes its way in, that evil sometimes affects relationships, that sin affects uh, different, different things. We have to ask the question, who or what is the source? Who is the author of this? It's real easy in our jobs, right, to say, well, I can't stand this person because they are dishonest. I can't stand this person because they are like this. It's real easy even in the church to say, I don't, this person in the church is blank, blank, blank. But again, we have to consider who the source is, who the author is, and all of us in this room should know that the source, the author, is Satan himself. And that's who Jesus is talking about, he's, or, or who Paul is, is talking about in this, is that he will protect us, he's faithful to protect us from the evil one. Satan's plan, as the thief, very clearly Jesus said, was to kill, steal, and destroy. So that's what Satan's plan is. He is the evil one. His plan on this earth is to kill, to steal, and destroy. He would so desire to do that with us, but here is the cool thing. Here's why this verse, and the last part of this, verse 3, is so awesome for us today. Satan's desire is that he would be able to kill, steal, and destroy from our lives. But he can't touch us without God's allowance. Satan himself would use his, his, his demons, he would use his, 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 his servants on this earth to completely destroy our lives, but he can't touch not even one hair on our head without God's allowance. Again, we have to consider the story of Job as an example for this. Again, he can stir and he can use his people, he can use his demons, uh, we see that all throughout Scripture, I believe that there's demonic activity, that spiritual warfare is real all around us in our lives. I've shared this before here in America. I think the spiritual warfare may be looking a little bit different than in a third world country. I think it's a different type of uh, demons that are used in certain ways in, in America than they may be used in, in places uh, in, in the third world. Satan can even use his people, use his messengers, to even kill our fleshly bodies. Jesus said, don't fear him that's able to kill the body, but fear him that's able to uh, kill both body and soul. But he can't touch our souls. He, can't, he, can, he, he may can take our lives, but he can't touch our souls. And, and, and that's where we as humans living in this temporal world struggling with the carnal man, struggling with the old nature, struggling with the flesh, that's where you and I can really get into a difficult place. Because the truth is, we want our lives, we want our physical bodies, we want our, our physical experience on this earth to be pleasant. We don't want it to be bad. We don't want it to be difficult. We don't want to face adversity and face all these problems in our flesh. We want everything to be nice and smooth. But we know, as Paul said, these are just earthly tabernacles. These are just earthly tents that we are walking around in. At one point in time, all of these earthly tabernacles are going to be destroyed. All of them are going to return to the dust. And so it's so valuable to understand and valuable to remember that regardless of how powerful Satan is, we'll talk about that in a second, regardless of how evil he is, regardless of all of his desires to do things to us and what he may even be able to accomplish in the temporal realm, the promise and the, the, the great promise is that he could never do anything. Those who are gods could never do anything to touch our souls. Nothing. And so what if I really get really bad? And what if I really make some really bad mistakes? And No, 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 we know that. There's no way Satan can touch our souls. Once we've been bought with that price of the blood of Christ, once we've been surrendered, once we are now in the hand of God, Jesus said, no man is able to take him out of my Father's hand. What can Satan do, though? Well, if you've been a Christian, you know very clearly that Satan can tempt us. And he can tempt us in certain ways. Here's, how he, here's, here's, here's one primary way I believe he likes to tempt us. He likes to tempt us to operate in our flesh. And if he knows that he can't take the souls of the church away from them, then his plan, I believe one of his greatest plans on this earth, is to affect their lives in such a way that they themselves tear down the work of God in themselves. 
Operate in the flesh, church. Operate in, in what you want. Be driven by your desires. Be driven by all these things. And Satan says, there, I may not be able to take their souls, but I can affect their effectiveness in the world. Because they're so focused on each other, they're so focused on tearing each other, but they're so focused on envy and greed and jealousy, and they're so focused on what people are doing and what people are not doing. And I, I, just, I don't have to do a whole lot. Just, I can just tempt them to keep operating in their flesh. They won't be walking in the Spirit. They won't be unified in the Spirit. And they can't accomplish the will of God for them even existing on this earth. I may not be able to take their soul to hell forever, but I can affect them touching other people's souls. And he's good at it. He's really good at it. Think about how many times as a Christian that you've been discouraged or disappointed, let down, struggled with another brother or sister in Christ. I've shared this before. How much of the New Testament did God inspire the writers, specifically the Apostle Paul, to write to the churches concerning how to treat each other, how to talk to each other, how to live with each other? Why? Because he knew, God knew us and knows us better than we know ourselves. He also knows his enemy, enemy better than we know our enemy. And so if, if, if he can get us tempted to get in our flesh, then we can miss the point of it all. The promise here to the Thessalonians is that the evil one is held back. He's kept at bay. We're protected in our lives. And again, he ultimately can't destroy us, can't do anything to us. But the greatest blessing in this, again, I believe, is the fact that he can't touch our souls, can't do nothing with our eternal, eternal souls. I think this is a great comfort, especially when you know what Satan is capable of. And we'll talk about that again in just a minute. But what a wonderful promise. But I want, I want us to understand that this wonderful promise is also coupled with something that goes back a little bit further, and that's a prayer of our Lord. As he was on this earth and preparing to leave and return to his dwelling place, to be at the right hand of the throne of God, we have this, point number two. We have our Lord's prayer of protection from the evil one. Not only is there a promise of protection against the evil one. There's a prayer by our Lord of protection from the evil one. John chapter 17, we've gone through this verse several different times in different messages, but I, I love this because, you know, when, when we take time to pray to God, a lot of times it's, that's just our bare, raw desires. It's, it's, it's what our needs are, and we go to God and, and, and we share those things. God, I need you to fix this. God, I'm struggling with this. God, Bless them. God, heal them. These are, these are the desires of a heart. We go and, and we share that. And in that moment, it's that intimate place that we're there before the throne of God. And here, in John chapter 17, God gives us this little glimpse at our Lord, God himself, on this earth, saying, these are my desires. These are my most intimate desires. Think about that. I mean, there have been some great uh, men of God, great women of God, that sometimes we have books that they've written. Sometimes we hear messages that they've preached. And we have all these things, and, and sometimes we think, man, I would just love to hear some of the things they prayed for. I mean, great missionaries that, that uh, are, are, are in, in history. Man, they were facing some of the greatest and most difficult situations. I wonder what they prayed in some of those instances. I mean, it'd be so amazing to kind of get that glimpse into what these people prayed and how they prayed and, and all those things. And here, the most sincere, most loving, the greatest pray, prayer as far as words and the greatest prayer as far as the person we get it, it's recorded for us here in john chapter 17 our lord and look what he says i just want to pick him at verse 6 i have manifested thy name again this is jesus this is the son talking to the father unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world thine were they and thou gavest them me and they have kept thy word now before we go any further this to me is a phenomenal verse and you say it just seems like a basic verse, it's a simple verse. Again, look, what, look back in, in, in some of the, the words here. The Father gave to the Son those who are His. And they were taken out of the world. They were consecrated. They were separated. They were plucked out. They were sanctified for the Son, by the Son, by the Word of God. And here Jesus said that they have kept thy word. They have kept thy word. The, the question here to me that, that stands out is 
does this mean that the disciples Jesus was praying for specifically, and that again would roll over into us further in this prayer, these disciples that he just said they've kept thy word, does it mean that they were perfect? The, these disciples, Jesus was praying to God the Father. He says, they've kept your word. Were they perfect then? Were they sin sinless? These were the apostles that Jesus chose. Well, we know, we have the history. We can go further and, and know that they weren't sinless. They had faults. They had flaws. They, they had shortcomings. They had sinned. But what this does mean is that they observed it. They obeyed it. And so it reflected. When Jesus says they kept it, it reflects their commitment and not their perfection. They were committed to Jesus Christ. They were committed to the word that was delivered by God through Jesus, and they had co committed themselves to obeying. And I think this is a true assessment of a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ. So when someone says, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, we know that no one is sinless. That's a misconception. That's a, that's a common misconception even among those who aren't Christians. They think that, well, if you're a Christian, why do you still do this? I don't go to church because all those so-called Christians do this and they do that. And Again, I think a true assessment of a true follower of Jesus Christ is not someone who's sinless. It's not someone who's perfect. But it is that we are no longer slaves to sin. But we are slaves of Christ. We're no longer the servants of sin, but we are the servants of Christ. So how do you know that's the case? Well, as a lost person, we're committed to sin. As a lost person, we're committed to following after what we want, what the world says, what the world dictates, what, what the, the, the enemy tells us. All those, We are slaves to sin, and so we can do nothing but sin. That's what we follow after. That's what we observe. That's what we keep. But as the servants of Christ... Again, therefore, a true disciple of Christ, we are known by our commitment, each person's commitment. And the obvious commitment to Christ is one that's seen in clear obedience to his word. That's how it's seen. How else can you know if somebody's committed to Christ? By them just saying, oh, I'm a follower of Christ. How many of us have run into somebody who says that they were a follower of Christ, but their life says nothing of following Jesus Christ? So what makes them different from us when we're not committed to obeying Christ? Instances, circumstances, a, a, an amount? Well, I think if you, if you obey Christ this much, then you are a follower of Christ. No, no, no. What sets us apart in our life is that we are committed as the disciples. Jesus was praying that the disciples were committed to keeping and obeying his word. So how can I say that I'm a Christian if I'm not committed to obeying his word? If when my life is examined, I'm not pursuing after, I'm not striving after being obedient to, to Jesus Christ and his word. So this is where we get off. This is where we get messed up. This is where the evil one comes in and tempts us to, to, to really get off track. Because so many, so many people who profess to be Christians aren't in the word enough and aren't making it a commitment in their life enough to be obedient to that. Not obedient to themselves, not obedient to what their desires are. Remember, we're no longer in that place. We're servants of Christ. And so to know his word, to hear his word, and as Jesus would pray in this prayer, receive his word and say, you know what? This is my life. This is what I follow after. This is what I will keep. This is what I obey. Again, this is the definition, the true definition of a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, to his followers in John chapter 8, a few chapters back, in verse 31, he says, Then uh, Jesus said to the Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. This word continue is to keep on, to continue in an activity or a continue in a state. It's an aspect of a continued action. So Jesus said, This is how you know that you are my disciples. There's only two ways that we can be active as far as our, obe or our, our, our response to the Word of God. There's two ways that we can be active. We can either continue to be active in obedience, or we can continue to be active in disobedience. 
because Jesus is saying this and because he's talking about following him, because his word is truth, it demands that this is active obedience. Because again, the context of the word. So he's saying this. If you continue in obedience to my word, then you show that you are truly my followers. That's what it is. So again, anybody, any of us, anybody in this, in this nation, anybody in the, around the world can say, I'm a Christian. Again, we just talked to someone last week, and, and, and I asked the person, do, do you know where you're going to spend eternity? I, I hope so. And then he began to talk about how he, had, uh, he believes that Jesus is the only way and, and all those things. After I started sharing a little bit more, he, he kind of rambled down that, that path, and I thought, this is just the same story, and I don't even know how many uh, chapters, how many books that, that, that I've experienced that with, with people. And again, this is no claim in, in, in my part or any of our parts that we're saying, you know what, well, were you saying you're perfect and sinless? Absolutely not. Neither were the disciples. I'm not saying that either. But when we look at our lives, and when you examine your life like I'm supposed to examine my life, it should be like this. I'm absolutely committed to obeying God's word. That's what my life is committed to. I'm committed to not not figure out what, well, is that what the pastor, no, 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 what does God's word say? And I'm committed to obeying that. And if the pastor's preaching that, then that, that's what exactly I'm going to follow. If that's what the Sunday school teacher is teaching, then that's what I'm going to follow. But the, the word of God, this is what it is. Jesus said, if your life is a continuance of obedience in my word, that's how people will truly know that you're my followers. And I want you to notice another thing, that all of this is in the plural. All of it. So all of these, this prayer, all of these statements is all considered in the context of the church. All considered in the context of family, in the context of body. Jesus was saying that they had obeyed his word. They, therefore, were together. The idea that someone can keep or obey God's word aside from or out of context, the context of the church, is a lie from the evil one. And I don't know if you've ever said anything like this or you've heard something like this, but this point is illustrated in Judas himself. We've seen a little bit even with, with Peter as he was separated, there on his own, there denying the Lord. So there's no such thing as, oh, I'm just following Jesus my own way. There's no such thing as me and God have an understanding, and me and God have our own relationship. I don't have to go to church to, to have this relationship with God. Jesus, God in the flesh, came to this earth, and he started the church. He, he started the church. Think about this. It's the only thing that God, when he walked on this earth 2,000 years ago, it's the only thing that he started. What's, that? What's so big about that? Consider this. The all-wise, all-knowing being, almighty, all power, all knowledge, he, he came to this earth. And he could have started an unlimited number of businesses. And in those businesses, he could have made an unlimited, an unheard of amount of money for his day. He could have come and he could have started all these things and been the richest person on the face of the earth, the richest person the earth has ever known according to man, which we know that he is. He owns everything. But he could have done that as he was in the flesh. But I find it so captivating that Almighty God comes to this earth and he was interested in starting and building one thing, his church. I mean, we, we, we hear different people starting businesses up and, and, and uh, uh, we know, well, that's interesting or, or, or something comes out that's really cool and we're like, oh man, that's awesome, that's a great business idea. I've said even before, man, the people, people at Amazon, whether you love them or hate them, they were genius. They've taken over our lives in so many ways. 
Some people are being burned, and they're like, I'm never doing Amazon again. But he was interested in one thing, building his church. He came to this earth, and he was interested in seeking and saving the lost. That's what he said. He came to this earth to seek and save the lost so that no man... have to spend eternity in hell so I want us to I want us to understand that we do not need to devalue this body we do not need to devalue this call our mission even as the people of God but we need to value and esteem it above all others to obey his word again it's vital to this truth that God's able to keep us from the evil one look on in in, in this in this prayer it says now that they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee I've given them, given unto them the words which thou gavest to me. And they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Again, remember, this is all in the context of they. This, it's the body, it's the church, it's the followers of Christ. And now look what he says in verse 9. I pray for them. Our Lord our Savior, the Son of God, going before God the Father, I believe in many respects it's, it, it's, it's, it's for a couple reasons. Why would God come to this earth uh, to, yes, we know to be the sacrifice, but why would it be chronicled, why would it be recorded for all of time, this prayer between the Son of God and, 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 and uh, God the Son and, and God the Father? Why would it do that? I believe, number one, so that we would know the heart of God for us. I believe also that we can see what a true prayer looks like. He says, I pray for them. He says, I, I, I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying for them which you've given me because they're yours. And all mine are thine and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. And now I'm no more in the world. Look what he says the rest of this verse, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. L listen, I'm, I'm not going to be here anymore, but these are going to stay here, and so that's why I'm coming to you, Father. Holy Father, keep through thy own name, through the power of your name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. You remember what I said just a minute ago? It's vital to this truth that God is able to keep us from the evil one. This unity, this, 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 this collective obedience and this unity to the word of, in the word of God. Jesus, our Lord, is praying that those who have his word, who've received his word and have believed his word, would be kept in safety by the power of Almighty God. And again, this would be done as a unified body. Look what he says in verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Again, Jesus was saying that he had, while he was here, protected and guarded those who were his. And no one was lost except for Judas. Remember what I said a while ago? There was one that was separated, Judas. He says in verse 13, Now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I'm, I, I'm, I'm coming to you, and, and, and this is what I am, am doing, so that they can have my joy manifested in their lives. I have given them thy word. He didn't say, look, I've given them the key to success in, in business. I've given them uh, the, 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 the mysteries of, of riches and fame. He didn't say that. He said, look, I am coming to you, and I'm speaking these things so that they would have my joy. And here's what I've done so that they can have my joy. I've given them thy word. I've given them your word, the word of God. And look what happens. The world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Again, there was a separation to God from the world, why? What was the separation? What, what was the distinction there? The Word of God. This is still the case today. The Word of God, the truth, is still the separating factor. Still is. You, 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 you look through every pseudo-religion, every, every false 
uh, teaching you look through uh, everything in the world, it all boils down to the truth. Rejection of the truth, or the acceptance of the truth. We've accepted the truth, and so the world doesn't receive us, doesn't accept us. It's the same as it was as Jesus was praying this. But how is it that it separates us? Just because we've accepted it? Yes. But even more specifically and importantly, I believe, that we obey it. Because I said, anybody can say, I believe that Jesus came and died. James even said, the demons believe and they tremble. What's the separating factor between us and the demons? If we, if we have belief in Jesus Christ, that he's the only way, truth, and life, that we, we, we believe in him, what's the separating factor? Well, James had talked about it in, in James. He says, show me your faith without works. And I'll show you a dead faith. Because you can't, you can't have that. Real faith has works. What does that mean? That means that if you believe, you obey. Because you believe it. Look, if I believe that lost people are going to hell, and the only way for them to go to heaven is to know that Jesus came and he died on the cross for their sin, and he rose again, if I believe that, and Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, then do I really believe it if I don't obey it? The disciples gave their lives for it. They believed it. They believed the truth that was seen in their obedience. Again, our, our faith, our belief is seen in our obedience. Listen now to the rest of the prayer in verse 15. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, that thou shouldest keep them from evil. Or again, here it is, the evil one. So, I've, I've preached this before, and, and this is what I talked about, is what, wouldn't that be an amazing thing? We, we've all talked about why didn't God just save us and take us home to be, be with heaven? I mean, I've got kids. I, I, I wouldn't, I mean, having them and then leaving them in a dumpster. Many of you have heard me say that before. It doesn't make any sense. This world is, is, is just a, a pile of, of, of garbage and evil all around us. Why does God take us and, and wash us and regenerate us from the inside out with his spirit? Why does he make us brand new? Why are we born again, brand new babes in Christ and then left here in the dumpster of this world? Why? Why doesn't God just take us and keep us from the, why doesn't he just rescue us from the evil one and rescue us from all evil? That's not the prayer of our Lord. That's not what his desire was for us because he could see a greater glory. He could see a, a bigger purpose, an eternal purpose in our lives than what we want for ourselves, which is an immediate gratification in every aspect of our life. He says, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, but here's my prayer is that you would protect them, that you guard them from the evil one. Again, he says, they're not of the world even as I'm not of the world. And here it is again. Sanctify them through thy truth. Consecrate them. Set them apart. Set them aside through your truth. Your word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. There's the heart of God. I'm not praying that you rescue them because there's a biggest, bigger, bigger purpose. Again, what was the purpose of the Son of Man coming to earth? The Son of Man come to seek and save that which was lost. Even so, send I you, Jesus said to his followers. Uh, you, you sent me into the, in this world to seek and save that which was lost, Father. And now I'm sending them into the world with this truth. They're set apart with that they're consecrated by, that they're to take to those who are in darkness, that those that are still under the, the master of sin. Again, the answer of the evil one and the world that he uses for his purpose is not that Christians would be taken out of this world. I have to say that I've been guilty of it before, of saying, man, I just can't wait for Jesus to come back. Not, not because I long to see him, because I want to be out of the problem. I want to be out of the difficult situation. I want to be out of having to deal with whatever it is. Man, I can't wait for Jesus to come back. Saying it like that. Now, I think there's some, I think there's, there's an okay 
sense to that because that, that points to the hope that we have of being out of this world and that our hope is in him and that he is our rescue and that he is our salvation and that one day every tear is going to be wiped away and we're not going to have to deal with all those things. I think there is, is an aspect that's okay to say that, but I think many times when we say, I'm just ready for Jesus to come back because I want to be out of the problem. I think that we may be missing the point altogether. Paul said that he wanted to go be with him, be with Jesus, because of his desire for Jesus, that I may win him. But again, our separation to God through submission and obedience to his word is where we'll find favor and protection from the evil one as we go into the world as ambassadors for Christ. That's what it is. So Jesus was praying for our protection from the evil one as we would be obedient and separated unto him and unto God by his word, through his truth. And again, nothing that he could do could ever touch us. The prayer of our Lord is still the prevailing power in our lives today as his obedient followers. And here's the interesting thing, and I'm getting close to closing. I, I think that we often attribute the enemy's attacks to things that are actually consequences of our fleshly choices. Consequences of our disobedience. I said the enemy did this, or if the devil would just leave me alone, here's what I believe. Many times, the devil is leaving us alone. We're just making messy decisions in our flesh, and we reap the consequences of that. So the devil can just stand back and watch. Well, I don't have to tempt them. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not actively pursuing the Lord. They're not actively obeying his word. They're operating their flesh, and they're doing a good enough job themselves. Again, not that the enemy doesn't have a desire, a role, or even an action in our walking of the flesh. But here's what I don't think we need to do. I don't think that we need to give him credit for the things that we're guilty of ourselves. We can often take that choice of stepping out of obedience, stepping into disobedience, and then in that process, opening our lives up to his attacks. I think there's too many times that we give the enemy too much room to operate in our lives through our disobedience, through our walking in the flesh. It's not that he's come along and he's, and, he's, and he's done these things to tempt us to pull. Maybe it's just in our laziness. Maybe it's just in our, in our lack of discipline in pursuing the truth and obeying the truth. So what does that look like? Maybe it's we get lazy and so we end up having a bad attitude. So we walk in the flesh. And we often can walk into the church or not even walk into church, walk onto Facebook and offend a brother or sister and then blame it on the devil. Yeah, Satan loves it, but we did it. Satan didn't do it. Again, he's the source of it. Or maybe it's a different way. We're not walking in love, therefore not allowing love to cover a multitude of offenses, a multitude of sin. And so we're easily offended. And so in the church or, or on Facebook or anywhere in our life, someone doesn't meet an expectation, and so we get upset. Somebody does something, division comes in. And yes, the evil one does rejoice, but it's us that did it. Again, what's the key factor? It's the word of God and our obedience to it. And here's the key in all of this too. We've got to be unified in this. Just as Jesus was praying for a unified body, just as he was praying for a group, we've got to be the same exact thing. And that's where the protection is. Here's the, here's, here's the truth, and I love this. There's never a time that God fails in protecting us from the evil one. Never. It's not that God misses the point or God misses the opportunity or, or, or that, well, maybe this one got by God. No, God never fails in protecting us from the evil one. But here's what happens, I believe. There are times that we leave that faithful walking and faithful fellowship with God, that we leave off walking in the Spirit we open ourselves up again, open our lives up, maybe even open our church up to the enemy. So, 
Does he try to capitalize on those moments? Absolutely. As I mentioned earlier, when we have an idea of what our enemy is capable of, it makes this protection and the way to ensure the protection so vital. Why do you think that every major country has an intelligence agency? Why do you think that, you know, you got all these, these concerns about uh, a, a, a spy and espionage and all these kind of things? Why? We were just talking about this the other day. You know that every major country has the... Why is it so important? Because you have to know what the other person is doing so you know how to be pr protected and prepare yourself. Why, why was the, you know, like the Chinese hacking uh, our, our computers in, in Russia, hack, why is this so important? Oh, well, change the password, you know. <laughs> it's a big deal because now we know in some regard what they're capable of. So we, what do we do? We have investigations. We try to find out where was the hole, where was the, where was the mistake, what, 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 what fell down, why, why did it go wrong? Why? Why would, we, why would we care? Oh, did they get anything? No, okay, change the password. You know, no, we don't do that. Where did it go wrong? This can never happen again. What if we were like that in our Christian lives? Where did it go wrong? This can never happen again. Again, when we know what the enemy's capable of, I think it helps us understand the importance of staying in the protection of God. Because we realize when, when we see some of the things that he's capable of, oh man, he's way out of my league. He's way beyond my capacity and my ability to keep myself strong, keep myself protected. I have to have God's protection because I know what the enemy is capable of. How vile does someone have to be to do some of the horrific things that you and I see on television? And maybe some, some people have experienced how vile does somebody have to be to be to do something like that? Even we consider the terrorists and we read about what some of the things they're doing to, to ladies and, and kids and, and, and stuff over there. What, how vile does someone have to be? Again, that's just what we know. They've got to be really vile. So where does that inspiration come from? Think about this. If God is absolute purity, God is pure in every sense of the word. He is the definition of purity. We don't know purity except because of God. Then what is his enemy? He's the source and absolute definition of debasement. If God is absolute truth, and the only way that we know truth and have truth, again, he is the definition of truth, then what is his enemy? He's the father of lies. If God is life, and in, without him there is no life at all, then what is his enemy? Of course, we know he's the author of sin, and the sin, the Bible says, brings forth death. So he's the author of it. If God is the source of morality, we don't know morality except, again, because of God. What is his enemy? He's the source of uh, immorality. So what is it? Paul told the Ephesian believers in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, that there was something that they could do to resist the evil one. That God had given them certain resources. It was the word of truth. It was their faith. It was the, it was, it was, it was the helmet of salvation. It was the, the truth. It was the armor of God. You have to consciously obey. You have to consciously put these things on. And so I want to encourage us tonight, if nothing else, to again, to know that there is a promise of protection against the evil one that we have in our lives that we can stand on, that God is going to protect us. But the second thing is seeing the heart of God in the prayer for us against the protection of the evil one. But with all of this, let's not be naive to think that we don't have a responsibility to stay obedient, to stay committed to being obedient to the word of God so that we stay under that umbrella of his protection. He gives us this choice. Again, his, per his power is absolutely perfect, but we have, we have to operate in it. We have to operate in the power that God gives. Again, it's found in obedience to his word. So the power, the tools, everything is there. And it's all in accordance with his will for our lives. But again, it's all seen and only seen in our obedience to his word. So now I want to encourage you to make sure that we take these things and have complete trust in God. That complete trust in God is going to be manifested in our obedience to his word. I just want to ask you tonight, is, is this how you approach every day? I know that I'm guilty of not approaching every single day like that. Now, it's in the, 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 the heart 
the heart of my heart to, to, to obey God's word. I don't, I don't want to disobey God's word, but to consciously every day wake up knowing that the evil one wants to destroy the plan of God and that every day if I'm not wholly committed, waking up every day wholly committed to make deliberate choices to be obedient to God's word, that means that I've got to be in God's word to know what it is. Then I open myself up. You open yourself up. Again, it's not that God falls short. It's not that God is slack. It's not that God can't do it. Amen. We've got to make the choice. Say, you know what? I'm putting on the armor of God. I'm, I'm know the word of God. I'm going, I, I'm consecrated. I'm separated by the word of God. And I'm going to be committed as those first disciples were to be obedient, to be known as a follower of Christ through my obedience, in Christ, obedience to Christ. The promise and the prayer of protection is still just as powerful today as it was for those first disciples those first uh, disciples of Christ. Still the same God, still the same power that he protects us with. So let's make sure that we're doing our part to be obedient, to stay committed to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us, again, to be reminded of this truth, to be encouraged in this truth that uh, there's nothing the enemy can do to us. There's nothing that he can uh, bring against us. God, you are, you are over us. You are, you are our protector. And we, we know that, Lord, we trust you in that. We, we, we rejoice in that as well. Uh, God, I pray tonight that we would be uh, challenged even in our approach to our daily lives. That we wouldn't think of your word as, as just something that um, it, it can, can be done with or without. But God, that we would look to your word as truth, as essential, more essential than our daily water, more essential than our daily bread that we eat for for our physical bodies, but that your word would be everything that we needed. God, help us approach your word as, as your eternal truths that you've delivered to us, and I, again, help us to be committed to obeying them. Lord, tonight I pray you just move now, help us respond to your word rightly, and we'll praise you for that as well. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand just for a couple minutes, they're going to play a song, and I want to invite you to come as a place.
Amen. Thank you so much again for being here this evening. Um, don't forget, tomorrow evening we have uh, organized outreach. And so hopefully you'll come out and uh, we'll put into action what we believe and help us get the uh, gospel to the community around us and um, see the Lord do something great. Um, I think that's it. Let's pray. We'll dismiss. Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for uh, allowing us to be here, gathered in your name freely. Thank you for your word, and thank you for the promises that you give us in your word. Lord, thank you for the protection that you give us um, in our lives from the evil one. Uh, we know that there's nothing that he can do uh, to our lives, um, nothing he can do to our souls, nothing that he can uh, do uh, without your permission. And God, we know that our protection is found in you, and it's found uh, in, in, in our hiding in the shadow of your wings and obedience in our lives. And Lord, we ask that you would just help us be strong in this. Help us to put on the armor that you've provided and cling close to you. Uh, we pray you also take us safely home tonight and help us be a witness for you as uh, we, we see the rest of this week uh, play out. We'll praise you for that. We ask you to take us home safely now. In Jesus' name, amen.